The following is brought to you by Digital Shelf Space, producers of GSP Rush Fit and Tour Academy Home Edition. Visit them online at digitalshelfspace.com. Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Vanessa Collette at the Toronto Resource Investment Conference. I'm joined by Leonard Melman, editor of the Melman Report. Welcome, Leonard. Great to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Leonard, you've been warning about the possibility of hyperinfl hyperinflation for a while now. Is it still a threat? I believe it is a threat. The hardest thing is to pinpoint timing. But what I've done is study several historic incidents of hyperinflation, like the breakdown of the Roman Empire, the French assignat inflation of the 1790s, the German hyperinflation, the most famous of them all, and the collapse of the Zimbabwean currency, which was the most mathematically devastating of them all. And I've searched for the kind of events that took place that led to those hyperinflations. And I believe particularly the United States of America, is following many of the same paths. Unlimited government financing, unlimited government money creation, an excess of debt, an inability to cut back spending. I think those are all happening. And they will, in my opinion, result in inflation, perhaps leading to hyperinflation. But like I mentioned, the hardest part of the equation is picking the timing. What do you think the inflation rate is really at right now? Well, that's a very good question. The, uh, the governments keep telling us it's one and two percent, but I think that's nonsense, and I'll give you a quick anecdotal experience. I travel by train. I'm an old-time train lover, and I happen to take the train from Seattle, Chicago, Buffalo to Toronto. I've traveled the same route each of the last three years and the prices on the Amtrak train restaurants have consistently gone up 10 to 15 percent every single year, and yet the government in the United States is telling us inflation is 1 to 2 percent. A, a tiny example is in the cafe shop, the uh, cafe car, they have uh, donut holes, kind of like Timbits. And three years ago they were $2, now they're 3 That's a 50 percent increase. So there are many, many uh, incidents like that, movie theater tickets, uh, grocery items. I believe true inflation is probably 7 to 10 percent, if I had to guess on a number. Now, Leonard, what's the cause of this inflation? Well, the, the base cause, according to monetary theory, is that there is an equation out there which goes something like the total amount of money in circulation divided by the total production of society. And if you raise the total money in circulation faster than the total production, then the price levels begin to rise. As opposed to uh, periods of incredible stability, like when we had a currency of gold, both in Canada and the US, gold rose over a century and a half period at about 2% a year as new discoveries of gold were made and industrial production rose about 2% a year. So the equation remained constant and most people from 1790 to 1930 virtually never experienced inflation. The same costs in 1820 would be found in 1920. Inflation is an identifiable consequence of too much money being circulated within the society. That, by the way, is a, a perfect definition of what happened in the monetary inflation in France of 1789 to 95, when they created these assignats to advance economic activity. By the time four years had gone by, they had added approximately 20 billion assignats to the monetary supply of France and it collapsed in hyperinflation. One side note, when the collapse took place, it led to economic chaos, and that helped Napoleon Bonaparte become emperor of France. Well, Bonaparte turned out to be a wonderful person and did everything he could to make France a good nation. In the 1922-23 German hyperinflation, that Wasn't also quite the caused case. <laughs> enormous chaos, and a very different kind of individual took a advantage of that to rise to power. So in hyperinflation is no minor thing. It 
actually has the capacity to destroy societies. So it's a, it's a very, very complex but ultra important phenomenon. So we should be very alert to any chance of it coming back. Well, speaking of that, what are some signals that you know investors could look out for that hyperinflation is about to happen? Well, visible price inflation is one. Another one is something we're actually beginning to see, and that's called currency wars. The Competitive people refer to as a race to the basement so that their currency will fall farther than their neighbors so they'll have uh, export trade uh, advancement or advantages. And in reality, we are seeing that in Indonesia, we're seeing it in uh, South Africa and Brazil and Japan. Japan. Japan is a classic case of deliberate devaluation of the currency. That's one of the real early warning signs because if you do that, everything you import into a country costs more of your home currency. That drives up the price of items, which leads to home currency or home inflation. And that leads to higher interest rates because the domestic economy wants to, investors want to get rewarded for over time for the devaluation of their currencies. And so what we're seeing now for the first time in Indonesia is they're trying to control this by deliberately raising interest rates. But the problem is if you raise interest rates, you cripple housing, you cripple auto sales. And so there is no easy way out. They're finding either they devalue leading to higher interest rates or they deliberately raise interest rates to uh, fight inflation. That's part of my whole thesis is that the whole international economic system is becoming inherently unstable. But, and this is where the short term comes in, the general public has been hearing from people like myself and many other uh, analysts of all these potential horror stories that could take place over the last five years. They've heard about we might have hyperinflation, but there hasn't been visible inflation. They've heard about how the European economic community might collapse, but it hasn't collapsed. They've heard about how America's debt is going to escalate into infinity, but that hasn't taken place yet. And every time they get a warning that doesn't occur, it's like the boy who cried wolf. They begin to stop paying attention, they assume things are really okay, and I think that's been a factor in the last two years' decline in the value of gold and silver. When that changes, when something happens that really grips the public's attention, then I think we'll see gold and silver start to take off and it could be a very spectacular show over time. So if you are so bullish on gold and silver, do you think investors should be getting into the junior mining sector? <coughs> Pardon me, I think they should, but I, there is a caveat I would offer. They should be choosing companies that appear to have the financial staying power to overcome what might be one last leg downward. And during the last two days, we've seen gold lose $50. But if a company can survive the next couple of years, then I think there's going to be, a, to use one of Howard Cosell's words, a plethora of opportunities to pick up valuable projects at incredibly low prices. So I think people should be looking at opportunities, but be very selective. If a company looks like they might not be able to last over the next year or so, I'd be very cautious about those. And like we were talking about earlier, if you do have a company that has profitable production, those are the ones I would hone in on because they don't have to endure the price or the, uh, the issuance of an enormous number of shares. Uh, so uh, that's something to be avoided at all costs. But production, financial staying power, those are the ones I would want. Those that are truly vulnerable for failure, I would stay away from. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Leonard. It was a pleasure having you. Oh, it's been delightful. Thank you very much.